Welcome to the Champs App Podcast, where we help parents and players demystify the world of minor hockey development and recruiting for both girls and boys. On this episode, I'm very excited to talk with Daryl Belfry from Belfry Hockey. Daryl Belfry is hockey's premier development coach who works with the Toronto Maple Leafs and well-known clients, including Sidney Crosby, Patrick Kane, John Tavares, and Austin Matthews. In this conversation, Daryl and I cover topics that he does not often talk about, including female hockey development, uh, advice for hockey parents, as well as the women's college hockey recruiting process. I really enjoyed this conversation with Daryl, and I hope you do too. Before we get to our guest, if you like this episode and want us to make more of them, please share it with friends and teammates. You can also follow, subscribe, and like, and even better, it would be great if you could leave us a review. Now, let's drop the puck and get to the show. Welcome to the Champs Hat Podcast. For today's episode, I am very excited to have Daryl Belfry from Belfry Hockey, who's also written the book, Belfry Hockey, Strategies to Teach the World's Best Athletes. Welcome to the podcast, Daryl. Yes, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, for today's podcast, as I kind of mentioned to you just beforehand, we're going to talk about women's hockey and the female game. We're going to talk about hockey from a different perspective, from a parent's perspective and what they can get out of your book. Um, and as well as kind of talk about your personal experience of uh, coaching a female player and going through the women's college recruiting process. So um, why don't we kick it off with kind of uh, you've worked a lot with um, female players and fr from girls hockey all the way up to the national team. Uh, and when I believe <clears throat> one of the first players you worked with was Hall of Famer Haley Wickenheiser. Um, and in the book, you talk about her playing, a bull, being a bull versus a spider. Maybe you can talk a little bit more, expand more about the concept of being a bull versus a spider and, and how you developed that with Haley. Yeah, so um, Haley was the very first uh, female hockey player that I had that I had worked with. So not a bad start, I guess, is to start right at the very top of one of the best, if not the best of all time. So I got a really good chance to get into her mind and how she thinks the game, which is a really important part of my own process. So where the bull and the spider came from was... Um, when she was when she was younger, of course, she was just a lot better and a lot more aggressive than the players in which she was playing against. And so there really wasn't many pucks that she uh, couldn't just go get. If she wanted the puck, she just go get it. Played center, so she had free reign of the whole ice and she could just go get it. And whether her reputation preceded her or whether her skill set and aggressiveness uh, preceded her, it just gave her a chance to get all these pucks. And then as time went on, um, when I started working with her, she was in a, more of a transition of trying to uh, find different ways to generate offense and find different ways to, to play to, be, to maintain her effectiveness. And so what I noticed when I watched her was she was just really just chasing the play and was spending all of her time just trying to force the game in every which way and just kind of assert her will over the game. And I said to her, um, you know, there's players who play very differently. Like if you take a look at a guy like Pat Kane, for example, like he doesn't force the play at all. His, he lets the puck come through him. He positions himself in intelligent ways where he's the most, he's the easiest guy on the ice to get the puck to. And then he can distribute and make those, those next plays. So it, the, I kind of was trying to create an analogy to really affirm it in her mind as to what the difference between those were. And I try to say like the bull is like basically a bull in the China shop, just go and get the puck and assert your will. But a spider is like a spider web where you have like all roads come to the middle. And if you position yourself in the middle, that all the plays kind of come through you. So it's just a little bit more efficient way and another way to be able to get the puck and you can get better pucks that way to use. So that's kind of where that, that all came from. And it was a, uh, she's mentioned it many times um, in interviews and such of just how much of a difference thinking about hockey from a different perspective, even at that stage in her career was, was interesting to her. And um, in your book, you talk about placeholder skills versus platform skills. So kind of at, at the minor hockey level, would you consider, um, you know, being a bull more of a placeholder skill where you're just like one of the fastest kids on the team and being very aggressive versus kind of the spider more of a platform skill, which is a skill you can develop and use at any level? 
Uh, yeah, there's definitely. So one of the problems that you have when the kids are in youth hockey is the disparaging disparagement of talent is so high. So the, the, the abilities and the physical ability of the best kid on the ice versus the kid who's at the bottom is really wide. So there's a lot of pucks that are relatively uncontested that a good player can just go get. And, uh, and so that can fool you into thinking maybe you're better than what you are, because as you move up, a lot of those, the, dis the disparity of talent comes a lot narrower and how you get pucks is very different. So um, if you're a player that, you know, physically imposes their will on people and you're just bigger and faster, eventually you're going to get to a league where you're not bigger and faster. And so then what do you do? And so the idea is to ask that question earlier. So it's not to say you don't want to use those skills. Listen, if you're bigger and stronger and faster, then I'm not going to tell you not to do that. Of course you want to do that. You just got to be careful that that's not your only way. You want to also be adding like, can I switch back and forth? Like, is this a time where I can force my, like assert my will? Or is this a time where it's better for me to, you know, be available for a pass or be better in puck support or look to get pucks in different areas? Like, it's just asking those questions before you need it. And I find in, in the, when you get into these placeholder skill situations, the problem is the first time that a player starts asking, what else can I do is when that whole situation that they've, that they've been successful with is now off the table. That to me is too late. And we as coaches and parents and the players themselves, we can start asking these questions a lot earlier. So then when the situation comes where they can't assert themselves in that way, they can be a dominant player in a different way. Great, great, great. Um, so um, we kind of talked about Haley. You, you've also worked with the uh, Canadian national women's team uh, as they prepared for the Olympics. You also had the, uh, the Kane Summit last year where you invited the top women from both North, from both Canada and the U.S. down there. Um, how, how was it working with, uh, how, how was working with the Canadian national women's team or, or the top women in the game different than what you expected? And, and do you see differences between how the, the women player engage with you compared to the men? Uh, yeah, it's, of course, it's very different. Um, when I first started with the national team uh, situation, they were at that time in between coaches. So they, had, they, were, they were in between coaches and it was a good opportunity for me to kind of come out there without a tremendous amount of like guidance in terms of like, hey, like these guys just need a really good skate. We want to see what they could do. Maybe you could challenge them in different ways. So I think they were just looking at that time for just like a different voice. So it was perfect for me because I really didn't know anything about women's hockey. I dealt with Haley, uh, but that was the, kind of the extent of what I had, what I had worked with. I hadn't really worked with anybody uh, in, a, in a group setting uh, from a female perspective before. So I just was, I had a lot of like preconceived notions about what they were capable of and what they weren't capable of. And none of those preconceived notions were correct. They, I was, I had missed the mark in every possible way of what I had assumed they could do and what they actually could do were completely different. So uh, then it became, okay, so they have a lot more capacity. So then how do I engage them? And it's very different. Like how you talk to them um, can be, can be very different if you, because in men's hockey, you allow for a lot of the, the player, your player is going to take liberties with whatever it is that you're doing. So uh, you understand that going in that you're going to bring them only so far and then they're going to take it and kind of run with it. On the female side, you have to create more permissions to do that because uh, they can be very literal in the way in which they process things. And if you don't create permissions for creativity, many of them, while are tremendously create, creative, they won't allow themselves to go there because they're just, there's not enough permissions there. And there is a, a need on their perspective to make sure that, you know, they're not doing it incorrectly. And so trying to find a way to say that this is just one way to do it. 
There's many ways that you can express this. I'd like you to explore all of them. That was something that I had to kind of learn to do because like I said, on the men's side, it's really implicit. Like that's kind of what they do. They, they get it, you get it only so far. They go, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they go and they start messing around with themselves. The females don't do that as much. You have to be much more directive in, okay, now's a time to be creative. Now's a time to mess with this. Now's a time to get going. And I, I don't know if I was the only one that made that assumption. And, but I, I know it came pretty quick that I, I was like, okay, like, why are they not like taking this, like and running with it? And it was because I hadn't created the permission. So working with them was good. Now you fast forward to when we had the 88 summit. Well, I had worked with many of those kids before some of them privately and some of them in group settings as well. I was much more familiar with what we could do. And so I thought I was better prepared for creating these permissions. And we were exploring a lot of topics that I know that they hadn't really ever talked about before, which was great because it's a national team. You're talking about the best players really on both sides uh, of the border working together. It's a pretty unique environment. And it was one that I didn't want to miss by being too conservative. So I, I really did try to stretch them, but in the same way to really try to um, give those permissions to say, I can take you into this discussion. We can get into this skill set, but then it's up to you to kind of run with it a little bit. And I thought that they did a great job, but, but I think most of that was, I think I was better suited because I understood it a little bit more. I still nowhere near the level of understanding that I need to be to be even more effective. And I'd like to be better with that. Great, great. And I know you've also coached, you know, minor youth girls hockey. Um, and I believe it was on a video that I watched previously about you that um, you mentioned that kind of their offensive capabilities haven't been unleashed because of some of this kind of restrictions that have been put put on them. You know, what, what have you seen and what would you recommend to, to, to coaches to, of these kind of Peewee, Bantam, even midget players that, you know, in girls hockey? I think uh, the biggest thing is, again, this whole permissions thing. I do think that they're way more capable and they can think the game at a better level than perhaps we get credit, we give them credit for. One of the big criticisms that you hear about girls hockey is that they don't watch hockey. And so because they don't watch a lot of hockey, at least uh, in the same amount that like a boy growing up would watch hockey, they perhaps don't watch it at the same amount or the same. So then that reduces their hockey sense and the under ability to see patterns and the ability, you know, to be creative offensively. And I don't know, like, yes, I, I can appreciate that they don't watch a lot of hockey, but I don't know that that is as precluding as we give it credit for. Maybe there's other approaches. If we know that that's not the case, then I don't know that we should be so just quick to dismiss it and say, well, they don't watch enough hockey, so they don't have enough offensive hockey sense. So I guess that's it. Like, what, what can we do? Our hands are tied. And I don't know that that's the case because my experience with them is if you get down conceptual uh, pathways and you create opportunities for them to explore, they will do it. And I think that where we run into trouble is we can be overstructured with uh with girls hockey and i just remember my, when i was coaching my own kid um very early on i uh, she's a defenseman and i i had said to her you know like that's a situation that you should be in front of the net and so then she just went in front of the net and she stood there and i said well what are you doing and she's like well you told me to go to the front of the net and like that was she was seven or eight years old at that time and i realized and i'm like no like these are the situations in which you go in front of the net and you have to read these situations. And sometimes you need to be here and sometimes you don't need to be here. And it's up to you to kind of decide based on what you're seeing. And here are some considerations. And once we went down that path, then of course she was able to read and make those plays. So again, like I, I think that, um, you know, also the other thing is, is, well, they don't shoot hard enough which is true. They don't shoot hard enough. And we're doing a better job of getting them better sticks and we're doing a better job of getting them, you know, in situations where they can shoot hard. But the other thing is, is that um, 
I think we could do a better job because they, they also think the game a little more team oriented. We could do a better job of getting the puck to move in areas where it's easier for them to shoot. Too many times they, they're skating themselves into trouble and then they have to shoot a 25-foot shot, which they don't have the power to be able to score, when maybe for them it's two or three passes and now when they get the puck back, now it's a cleaner lane, it's inside of you know 15 feet, now they're in a spot where they could probably score more frequently. So it's more of a situation where, yes, they don't, re they don't watch a lot of hockey or as much, Yes, they don't shoot it as much, but I don't think those are as precluding if we as coaches understood them more and we give them more opportunities to be able to do things that more suit their skill set. I, I don't know that we've adapted enough, and I, I guess that's my, that's my point. I think it's on us. It's let, all we hear about is what they can't do we don't hear enough about what we're not doing and what parts do we not understand. And that's where I'd love the conversation to go. And, and in your experience, do, do you find that the girls are getting the same, uh, you talk about a term depth of skill, uh, as the boys are for their equivalent ages. So at 13, 14, 15, they have the same depth of skill and it's more how they play the game. Or is it also still just some, some of the fundamentals? No, I, I there's, there, the, uh, in my lap, and I call it a lap, meaning like my daughter's 16, so I'd call that a pretty pretty full lap of minor hockey. I've seen some girls that are just tremendously skilled. They can skate, they can handle the puck, they can shoot, they think the game really well. I think the every year that goes by, there's more and more and more kids in the pyramid at the top is getting wider and wider and wider. It's really exciting. So I think we're starting to see that there's way more capacity that each of these kids have. And there's more now opportunity, uh, more opportunity to play with girls earlier. Uh, one of the biggest challenges I think we had early on with girls hockey was that there wasn't enough of them to make leagues. And there wasn't enough good ones to make a big league at the top that allowed them to stay with each other. So there you have like one girl on a boys team who's trying to battle in that environment, which up until a certain age is fine. But then after that, it can be, you know, it can be challenging. And so now we can have a lot of those like early kids that come out that are really good. We can keep them or put the, have them in girls leagues sooner, which then builds the whole thing. So I think that just, um, as the sport has grown, and it's grown exponentially over the last uh, however many years, 10, 15 years, I think now we have more of them, which now they can play together. We have more female coaches. We now have coaches who are, you know, have gone through and played college hockey who are now coming down and coaching these kids at the different levels. That is awesome. I mean, one of Ella's very first coach was uh, Manon Rayon. That was one of her first coaches, you know, so she's that's a, Caesars now. She's, yes. She's, she's that, she's yeah. So she Caesars. was, she was coaching spring hockey for Ella at Ella's uh, level. And Ella played for her with, for like four years. She played uh, for Manon, but there's someone, a highly uh, accomplished female hockey player who's now, you know, at the youth level in the grassroots, who's influencing and encouraging more female player players to become coaches because now they have the benefit that I'll never understand. I just don't, I'll never understand fully how they think, how they feel. I just don't, I'm not going to get there with that. So I think the more female coaches we have that have the capacity to teach and have the capacity to, uh, to convey the game, the better the whole thing is going to go. Not to say that men's coaches can't do a good job because they do. And in many situations, they do a great job. Just think that having a female on your staff who can really kind of bridge some of these things that you're just never going to understand is going to make a huge difference. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So now I'd like to you talk about being a parent. 
um, let, let's transition kind of to the parent side of things. Um, so with your book, uh, how would you recommend parents leverage the lessons from Belfry Hockey? I know it's more targeted to, to coaches and, and skill development for, for teachers themselves. Um, but, uh, you know, someone like me, who's just a parent who's, you know, wanting to, to help their kids be as, be the best that they can be. Um, you know, I got a huge amount out of the book as, as you kind of pro probably saw in my posting that I, that I, uh, wrote last week. Um, what would you recommend? What lessons can they take out of it to help their kids? Yeah, I think that the, the best way to, to digest the book as a parent is through the eyes of your child. And what, it, what I think the book does is it highlights a lot of questions of way in which we do things, in which you can create conversation amongst your, like pick up something from the book, um, a passage or whatever, and create a conversation with your kids about uh, about those type type of topics, just to bring the topic to the forefront on uh, the question about it, and that would then lend itself to them starting to problem solve some of these things. So I, I purposely wrote the book um, not necessarily as a guide with all the steps already in place. Um, I didn't want to do it that way. It, it's meant to foster discussion and questions. That's what it's meant for. Um, it, and that's everybody, whether it's the NHL all the way down. It's when anybody who's reading it, whether you're a parent, coach, player, whatever, um, I really wanted it to just foster questions. So in my mind, the best use of the book is to find a passage that's intriguing to you and create a discussion. And that discussion could extend, you know, with the player, could extend with their coaches that coach them. And all of a sudden now there's a discussion and then, and then who knows where that goes. And that's really what I'm hoping for um, as parents digest the book. Got it. So, so what are some ways that parents can help their kids work on their hockey IQ since that is such a key element to, to kind of um, developing um, you know, platform skills and, and getting to the next level. The, one of the best parts of uh, social media is the worst part of social media. So the best part of social media is you can digest a lot of clips in a very short amount of time because, you know, it's 10 seconds here, it's five seconds here, it's seven seconds here. It's, and you can go through like all the goals that a certain player had scored or whatever. What you don't end up with is the context of what happened before that allowed that shot or that situation to occur. So my biggest, uh, my biggest concern with, um, with players as they digest that, the hockey in that way is they only see the very end. So it'd be like being at school and all you get is the answers, but you never get any of the process leading into that. So one of the best things that you can do, I think, just really a twofold. Number one, I think every kid should watch themselves play. I, I think you should, whether it's Live Barn, whether you're videotaping it yourself or whatever, I just don't think it's, I don't think it's bad for any kid to re-watch their shifts. Watch them again because they're going to see different things. One of the thing, biggest things with kids is, the, the biggest thing that you get when you watch, we watch your own shift is they realize it's not as fast as it feels on the ice. When they're on the ice, it feels like it's going a million miles an hour. But then when they watch like, whoa, like I had a lot more time than I thought is one of the things that you get from it. So watch your own shifts, number one. Number two, try to watch just a period instead of a, a period or shifts of a player. Or of a game, instead of only watching just the little snippets here and there, because you're not going to develop as much of the how to by only watching the, the answer. Yep. So the more we can get them to watch, and you know, you don't have to watch a full game, but you can watch a period, periods, 20 minutes, you know, you can watch 10 minutes here, but you're watching shifts after shifts and seeing kind of the context of the game. I don't know that we do that enough. And I think it's like, well, they don't watch full games. Well, full games, two and a half hours. It's a long time. I don't know that these kids are going to sit. I don't, I don't, I know I don't always want to do that. So maybe we can get it down to here's a, here's a five minute section or seven minute section of a game, all the shifts in a row, 
watch that, look for trends and look for uh, patterns and look for th- like, how did this thing happen? What, where did it start? Well, oftentimes the goal started with a play like in the defensive end. Let's talk about that and how the game sequences. Hockey sense is about patterns, recognizing patterns be- as they're happening and anticipating what's going to happen next. You're not going to get that by the way we're consuming the game right now. Got it. So that actually leads into my next question because um, you talked about watching where things uh, originate. A lot of times that happens at, at a transition where the puck changes possession. Um, mm-hmm. So what are some of the, the, the challenges that you see in coaching and skill development at the youth level, like 14U, 16U, et cetera, in terms of, you know, uh, risk taking, you know, how they enter the zone, all these transition elements, like, like what do you see being taught and what do you see, what do you wish would, would be taught? Well, one of the things I try to talk about a lot, the biggest thing with transition is we often talk about the kids that are at the puck. So it's five on five, and we have three of them at the puck, a primary triangle of players that are working at the puck. And we have two players who are furthest away. The two kids who are furthest away, while they have responsibilities offensively, in the, like let's say we're talking about offense. So we're on offense and the two we're in the offensive zone, the two kids furthest away from the play, maybe the two defensemen. Well, those two defensemen can be actively moving in a dual offensive and defensive pattern so that they're available to be able to get a puck, but they're also available that if the play started to break out, they're close enough that they could kill that play right away and maintain possession of the puck. So I don't think we talk enough about the kids who are the furthest away from the puck and what they can be doing and what they can be thinking about. We often view it like, hey, you're at the point, you're on offense. So you're at the point, wait for the puck. Well, no, you're at the puck on offense, but at any second, the puck could turn and now we're on defense. And so because they weren't doing anything beforehand, they were only on offense. Well, now the other team gets it. They have 25, 30 feet of space. So now we just back up and that's not offense that, or that's not transition. That's defense. You, you missed a window of opportunity where you could have been in transition. So I think challenging the kids away from the puck, like, Hey, what are you thinking about right now? Is there something you could be doing? What happens if that puck turns? Where, where can you be? Who's your responsibility? And now they're thinking as they're going, okay, we're on offense. I'm going to position myself here. But if we lose the puck, that's my check right away. I'm going to be close enough to be able to get that player. That's the type of stuff that I think we can do a better job of offensively. And then just uh, taking away a lot of the unnecessary hard rules about using the middle of the ice. So we, we often will say never use the middle of the ice. Well, if we're talking about female hockey, as soon as you say never, that's going to be precluding to almost every kid. You might get one or two that are like, okay, I can, there's times I can take liberties. Everyone else is going to just be like, that's the rule. I'm following the rule. And then you get in a game, well, of course, there was times where they could have taken the middle, but you made a hard rule. And so I think one of the things that we can do is instead of having hard rules, teach the game by principle. So when it's available, they do it. And when it's not, they don't. And that there's a read and we teach the read rather than, hey, or like one of my favorites that happens in girls hockey all the time. And if you watch a lot of girls hockey, which I, I feel like you do, you'll appreciate this. How many times have you seen a puck go back into the defensive zone? So it was in the neutral zone. Now it's in the defensive zone. And the other team is kind of on a change. And uh, the girl will refuses to pass it in front of the net. She'll take it all the way back to pass it behind off the back wall because she will not carry it and she will not pass it in front of the net. Well, there's no pressure there. There's nobody that the whole team is on a line change. There's no reason for you. There's no risk for you to use a pass that goes across the net. 
But the rule is never pass it in front of your own net. So if that's what you tell them, that's what they're going to do. And so I think the biggest thing we can do is take away the hard rules, like never use your backhand. Really? We're never going to use the backhand. And now you see kids that just will never use their backhand. Like, is that what we really want to do? No, you don't want to use a backhand under certain pressure where you can't see. And of course it's going to get picked off, but there's lots of times where you could use the backhand. That's what I think we run into trouble with is I think we're too quick to put a rule in. And like I said, a lot of boys further down the lineup will, they're going to use your rule loosely. And there's going to be times in which they make executive decisions. Girls, for the most part, if it's a rule, it's a rule. They're, they're just, that's it. There's no executive decisions going to happen. And I think we have to be way more mindful of that in how we present it. And that's why principles over structure and rules can make a massive difference in the growth and development of all players, but specifically females. Right. So actually, I'm going to build off of that one for actually a, a situation that, that my kids have encountered um, and that you talk about in the book, which is um, skill development versus winning. So one of my kids' coaches in, in Pee Wee and Bantam um, you know, says that practice is for skill development and games are for winning. So, which is why they justify kind of playing more conservatively in games uh, by asking some of the less skilled players to kind of dump the puck in in certain occasions and even, even uh, benching some of the, uh, some of the kids when, when the game is close. Um, so what advice do you give to parents with kind of an old school coach like that? Well, I, I don't even think it's old school. It's, it's as much as, it's as, much as the uh, inherent... Um, ideas that surround what success actually is. So if you're coaching in the National Hockey League, winning is really important. The average coach uh, career is like two and a half, uh, not career, but they stay on one team. It's like two and a half years. Like if you're there for three years, you've really done a lot. So of course, the ideas towards winning are, are paramount. I have to win to keep my job. We tend to listen to all of the narratives that are uh, come through the NHL speak. So the coach is interviewed, the players are interviewed, and we take those quotes and we try to apply all of them to then youth hockey. And now youth hockey is not under the same, same idea. You can lose and it's the sun's going to come up tomorrow. Like you're going to be able to go to your job and you're going to, the kids are going to go to school and they, they're, everything's fine. Like we don't have to, like we don't, winning and losing is not, uh, is not as much of a, a major problem as, as it is maybe at the highest level. So my argument is, is that even in the NHL, we talk a lot about development. Even in the NHL, we talk a lot about development. So, as it filters down and we're talking about kids hockey, how much of winning is really all that important? It's all development. It all is development. And so Ooh. the idea behind, and, and you know, financially sometimes this, this is uh, problematic, I think uh, for teams, but the idea of carrying three lines and six defensemen, or some teams you'll see them carry four lines and six defensemen on. Uh, and economically, I think that that's kind of the reality is that that is what allows people to actually be able to play, which is so disappointing because for the most part, up until 11 or 12 years old, you probably could run a game with 4D and six forwards. And that way you, everybody's going to play and you're almost better to have two teams of six and four than you are to have one team of nine and six and take three kids and throw them out to another uh, level and which is a whole other discussion, but it, 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 it does speak to this whole idea of like, how much do we, how much of this is real development and how much of these things do we make decisions for these kids based on economics and the need to win. So how, how does this circle back to what can we do? Well, as a parent group, we have to make decisions. What is it really that we're trying to do? What is this year all about that we're here with? Would you like to win? Yes, it's more fun when you win than if you lose. But 
is it really all, is it all, all about winning to the point in which we're going to ostracize a kid from our team by telling them they're not good enough to play in certain situations? Is that, is that what winning is for us? Is it, is it that important? I don't know. It, it, I don't know. I just feel like um, if all the, if we're talking about player development in the NHL being a factor and looking for opportunities for players to play in certain situations at that level, then perhaps we should be thinking about it at, at the lower and younger age groups where it is all about development. And I don't know how much fun a kid's having when they don't play. It's their turn to go. They get to the door and they're like, no, you have, and they shove like, it's, it's traumatic to do that to kids. And, um, I don't know that winning is that important. And I think as parents, we inadvertently put that onto the coach. And then that, when it doesn't, when it goes bad, then we blame the coach. Oh, well, look, he only cares about winning. So I don't know if it's an old school, new school kind of a thing. I think it's cultural that this is what we do and it's okay until it's our kid. Like, mm. I don't mind it. I don't mind people getting sat. I don't mind to, until it's my kid, then, well, wait a minute. Now I have a problem. And so then you have to kind of grin and bear it because you don't want to be that hypocritical parent. But the truth is we all kind of have that. And that's, we need to do a better job of creating and demanding the environment we actually want for our kids with those coaches and getting organizations to have coaches who are more mindful that this is a lifelong sport we want everyone to be able to stay with it as long as we can. I think, I think that's more my perspective than anything else on that. Yeah. yeah. Well, having been on both sides of it, um, you know, my conclusion is somewhere you just let them all play, um, just run all the lines all the time. And that way, you know, you really are saying, yes, development is more important than winning. Even if uh, you win this game and you play an extra game or something like that at the end of the day, over the course of a season, it all evens out. So. Well, well, when I was coaching, I would do things like, you know, I would try to find situations where, you know, kids could play together. So one of the things that you can do is you can put better, the better kids with like the top three kids on your team, put them together, take the kids who aren't like the, they would represent seven, eight, nine, put them together. But then you have to find lines against the other team where you can create that matchup. So it makes no sense for you to put your best line against my third line, if I'm setting up my lines this way. And the reason why is because, yes, of course you're gonna dominate, but how good are you? You're, you know, you're better off going against my best players. Yep. I don't think we do that enough. We talk about winning, but then I'm gonna put my ninth forward with my best player because I need to balance out the lines. That, that, that to me is, has some a ridiculous nature to it. Put the best kids with the best kids. Let them think at that level. Let them play at that level. Let them skate at that level. Move it down. And then when we're playing, I should be actively looking to put my best players against your best players yep. and my third line against your third line. I think that that's also a better way to do it. But again, like you need to have a little bit of collaboration amongst the league yeah. has to understand, like, what are we really doing? What is, at the end of the day, what do we really do? Does it really make sense if I'm a better bench coach where I can weasel my way of getting my top kids against your third line to force you to have ice balance where now you're playing effectively a man short. You put your best player with your seventh and eighth, seventh and ninth forwards. Like, is that really good for the best player on the team to play with two kids who they're just not there yet? Again, it comes back to the same thing. What are we really doing? I think we need to have more of a discussion about what are we really doing? And as a parent group, like we need to be more active in like, what is it we're trying to do and help coaches be able to coach that way. Cause there's nothing worse than being a coach, having all the designs of having a team where you're trying to play everyone, you get there and everyone's just like, Hey, we lost our first three games. This coach is no good. You know, like they get, it's, it goes both ways, I guess, is my point, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so let's get like really practical. So if I'm a parent who knows, you know, enough to be dangerous about hockey, but not really a, a hockey player, um, what, what should a parent like me look for when watching a hockey practice? I, I think the, the biggest thing is, is how 
much is your player being in, engaging in the practice? And there's all different levels of good practices, right? And some practices, we've all been there where there's one kid moving and there's seven kids standing in a line. So the work rest ratio is one to seven. So by the time it's my turn to go, like I've forgotten what we're actually doing because I'm like looking in the stands, I'm looking everywhere else and you're just not engaged. So I think the engagement level of your player, your, your, your son or daughter, I think is really important. And if it is a situation in which um, it, there isn't as much engagement for them, that there's things for them to do to keep engaged. Like watch, I want to see you watching the kids in front of you. I want you to pay attention to what they're doing. I want you to be, while you're watching, handle the puck. So now you're stick handling while you're watching. Like finding ways to get engaged. Take a look at this drill, do it a couple of times, and then try to find a way to add something to it. So maybe your kid's one of the best kids on the ice and you know you have this situation I just described, which is very difficult for them to stay engaged. They can do all the skills because the coach has set up the practice so that it's good for the seventh, eighth, and ninth forward, but way below your capacities. Well, then that's up to you. You have a responsibility as a player to add difficulty into it. You know, do everything with your head up. Uh, pass, to, pass to somebody with your feet moving. Uh, shoot for different spots. Create a game between you and the goalie. Hey, it's one nothing me. Hey, it's 2-1. Hey, it's 5-4. Like, that's really engaging. That's fun. And that's a way to turn the practice into something really engaged where they're focused on something. I think that a lot of times kids are bored. Um, we don't have enough people that move the ice in a way that keeps it really hopping and popping and really engaging. Or if we do, we have situations where when it slows down, it's heavy teaching and it's a lot of technical stuff, which can be difficult for some kids to process. So we tend to alienate a lot of kids in the practice environment, which makes it difficult. So you have to know your own kid, how they learn and how to best get them to engage longer in what they're doing to try different things. Hey, you're standing in line, put the puck in and out of your feet. Hey, you're standing in line, try that, you know, toe drag to go to your other side, but keep your head up. So you know when it's your turn to go, or you know what's going on. Or like I said, create a game, try to go against the same D, go against the best D all the time and create a competition. Hey, I'm going against you. It's one, nothing me. Oh, it's two, one for you. You know, all practice long, you're working and arranging to try to go against the same D all the time to try to keep this up. There's lots and lots and lots of things that you can do as a parent to not disrupt the coach's practice, to not interfere with the context and content of what it is that they're doing, to not create waves or be angry um, or pass that anger. Yeah, pass that anger. Or you're the third base coach you know, giving all the signals and stuff. You, you don't need to do that. There's lots of other ways in which you can do that. Do, you can help your child be engaged in the practice without being disrespectful to what's going on with the volunteer people that you have coaching your kid, but still keep them engaged and to try to try these different things. I used to do a lot of those types of things with Ella. I'd have all kinds of different challenges that she would do. Uh, we, she played for one coach, did the same practice almost verbatim every, every practice. So she's like, Oh my God, dad, like it's the same practice. I said, well, that's good. Well, how's it good dad? I said, well, it's good because now you know what's coming next. You can start thinking about different skills. You can add to what's going on. If you do the same practice over and over again, yes, the coach could, you know, find a way to be a little more creative, but it's still on you. Like at the end of the day, your hockey is your hockey and you have responsibility. And if you don't, if you don't think that this is engaging enough for you, then you need to find ways to be more, to find it more engaged. And so she would take a lot of pride in adding things to the practice that were the same pattern. She's not all of a sudden going off to the left when she's supposed to follow a pattern to the right. Not that just doing different things inside of that, like having add a shoulder check 
you know, do uh, something with where you're in a puck protection before you pass. Like there's lots of things that you can do. And you have this discussion, like how can you make the best of this so that you find your way getting better? And what was interesting was once she got started, other kids started to do similar <laughs> things, which was really cool as well. Nice, nice. So, um, uh, so you, you talk about what kids can do to help their, uh, sorry, what parents can do to help their kids while, you know, during practice. Um, off, uh, outside of, of practice, what advice do you have for, for parents who, who live in an area that don't have a Daryl Belfry where they live, kind of a skills coach? What, what can they do? Uh, obviously, video is something that you mentioned earlier. Any other thoughts on, on what parents like me who don't have someone like you in the area to, to help, help their kids? I would engage in a self-directed learning process with your child. I would videotape their games, videotape training sessions or practices. I would get vid NHL video for them to watch. And I would have them tell me what to do. What's going on in this play? Have them explain it to you. What's going, what, what other options are there? And you basically are asking questions to, uh, to drive a conversation in which they start uh, coming up with things on their own that they want to work for. What happens is, is that by going through that process, you start to get used, you, you will pick up themes of things that are coming up most often that are either questions that they have or areas of opportunity that they could be better with. Now, when you go and you want to, whether you're hiring a, a, a private in instructor to work with your kid or you're going to decide what hockey camp they're going to go to, or you have a bunch of kids come, come to the rink to, to work together, well, now you can direct what you want taught. Hey, we've been talking about this. The child has been engaged in this conversation for weeks. They've looked at their own video. They've looked at NHL video. They have questions. Now you bring someone in and instead of just saying, hey, I'm going to hire you do for the hour, you now have a kid who's self-directed in their own learning. So you imagine taking your kid to a private lesson in which you had a discussion with that coach to say, hey, this is the type of things we've been talking about. Can you address some of these things? How engaged do you think your kid would be? Versus, hey, let's find a, the Daryl Belfry of this area, get my kid out there and just trust verbatim whatever they're going to do with them. To me, you have to create the best learning is engaged learning. So even if you don't have, even if you have access to someone like me and, and you're just going to trust me blindly that I'm just going to do whatever I'm going to do with your kid, you're still not getting the most out of it because you need the engagement. So the fact that you may not have someone like that in your area can be an advantage because it'll drive you into the thought processes of your own kid, which I just can't think of a more fun thing that you can do as a parent with your own child. So speaking of a parent with their own child, then let, let's talk about your uh, working with your daughter. Um, how, how did you apply your own teaching philosophies kind of with your daughter's, daughter's hockey development? And then kind of what did you get right? And looking back, what would you might have done differently? So Ella has been, Ella's the only kid I've ever worked with, which I started at the very beginning. So when she started, she was like anybody else. She couldn't skate at all. So I had an opportunity now to, uh, most of the kids that I was getting up until the time in which we had Ella starting, I was getting them at seven or eight or nine years old. So they were already could kind of skate. They could already had a functional understanding of the game, et cetera, et cetera. So she was the first one that was like right from the beginning. And Ella will tell you, I've called her a science project for years because that's effectively what she has been for me in my teaching. I utilize the fact that she loves hockey. She loves being on the ice with me. And she was very, she's very coachable in the sense that um, I've never run into a situation in which, you know, a lot of parents will tell me like my kid, they don't want to listen to me. They want to listen to someone else. I, for whatever reason, my relationship with Ella is such in which her personality lends itself to this type of instruction. So she's never at a stage where she's like, okay, like I'm done listening to you. So I've leveraged that to try a lot of different things. 
And so the way I've utilized Ella's development is very much like uh, she's a test tube and I just throw different stuff in it. That's how I approached it for the longest time. And um, because I had a lot of questions, a lot of questions as it related to different types of development. And now I had a student that I was going to be with me all the time, just gave me a chance to really try some things. What worked well was um, engaging her in the process. I, I do a lot of things where she is self-directing a lot of the learning and, and I do a lot of video review with her where she is teaching me. I'm not just going through the video and pointing out all this stuff. We'll create themes of things of which we're interested in and then we'll start tracking those things and we'll take a look at it from different perspectives. And But she is actively leading the discussion and I, I really have felt like the collaborative nature of that relationship between her and I has extended my voice with her because it's not just do this, do this, do this, do this. Hey, Daryl, just a quick question. At, at what age did she kind of start taking that ownership of, of leading the conversation? I would say probably eight or nine. Okay. I started that process. It was yeah. pretty early. Um, now, it's all uh, based on percentage. So at eight or nine, I'm asking her 10% of the time and 90% of the time I'm very self, I'm very, I'm directing it. Now we're at a stage where it's so completely flipped, right? It's now it's, it's, so it's a process that takes years, but at first I'm trying to teach her how to watch video, how to watch herself on tape. How, and then I would pull the like instances together so she could see them all in a row. And then she could say, oh, well, this is different or that's different or this is it. And I was really impressed by some of the things that she was able to see and glad I asked the question instead of me just assuming, which I think I had done a lot of that beforehand. I just assumed what she knew instead of asking and putting, creating an environment in which she could tell me inadvertently. So what did I do? What I'd like to do better? I think I underestimated her ability earlier, earlier on and could have advanced my level of thinking in what I was trying to do with her way faster. I was in that impression that, you know, uh, she, she was, well, she wasn't watching full games, so I was, I had it in my mind, just like everyone else. Well, obviously like her hockey sense is going to be lower and it's this and that. And, um, and that just wasn't the truth for me. I, I feel like I could have done more things differently as it relates to challenging her, uh, her mind, uh, and giving her more responsibility early on for her own development in the stuff, because now we're at a stage where she's so self-directed, um, and I'm just, answer, I'm answering questions. She's, she's asking me and now I'm answering the question. She's got things that she's interested in, which is a great place to be in. But the collaborative nature of my relationship with her allows me to hold a voice a lot longer than maybe I would have. That was probably the best thing I did as it relates to her development. Nice. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, she is committed to go to Colgate in uh, 2023. Um, yes. And she committed last year, right before the uh, NCAA changed their rules for recruiting. Um, yes. So, hey, maybe you could just uh, talk to us about what the recruiting process was like for you as a parent um, and what, what factors were important to, to your daughter and, and, and your influence on, on that decision. Um. Well, what I tried to be was more of a sounding board. It had to be her decision. She's the one that's going to be going there. So she's got to be comfortable. It can't be me. And um, uh, we're, Ella is a very strong academic student. So going to a school that was going to be challenging for her academically and provide her what she wanted at the back end of that, because at the end of the day, that's that's what she's getting out of, out of all of this is that opportunity to get an education and have a chance to be able to play hockey while she's there. It's a phenomenal opportunity, of course. So you got to, the choices come down to personal preference. You know, do you want to go to a big school? Do you want to go to a small school? Do you want to, you know, how, what's the education like? What, how comfortable are you with the campus? How comfortable are you with the, the people that are going to be involved? What other players are there? Then we also, one of the things that we did, uh, which I think is really important is we did a lot of research on the, uh, the, the state of the, 
of the roster. So when you go in, how, mm -hmm. as a defenseman, how many senior defensemen are there? How many junior defensemen are there? How many, what, what's the opportunity to be able to earn up, up, earn opportunity to play? Or is this going to be a situation where, you know, you're going to be the seventh or eighth D to first year, and then you're going to ease your way into the lineup. Like how comfortable are you with the configuration of the current configuration, which is going to, there's going to be changes to that. Of course it, it always does, but at least Did you also look at like left-handed versus right-handed D. I'm just curious if you got into that level of detail. Uh, no, because I don't think that that's as much of a factor as it used to be. Um, I think that most schools uh, just take the most talented kids that they can. Um, I don't think that they're as much left or right um, motivated. It was, uh, was more uh, graduation years and what entry years and when the kids were coming in, that was most, that was, was most interesting but I think doing your homework on each of the schools and um, I think my role as it related to her thing was she was fortunate she had a, a, a couple of different schools that were that were interested in her so it gave us a chance to kind of make some comparisons and get an understanding of what was going on they had opportunities where they have like whether it be one day hockey camps or things like that at the different schools. And so we went to those to so give you a chance to be on the campus and ask questions and stuff like that. Cause even up until those points, you're not real, you're not able to talk to the schools directly. I think the way that it's going to be going forward is going to be a way better time because you think about it. I mean, Ella committed when she was in grade nine, there's a lot of water got to go under the bridge before you come out of school, before you, uh, before you go. So now, with the way that the rules are set up, I think it's way easier um, to be able to make good educated decisions for us. We had to try to take the widest swath of information that we could match that up with what Ella's actual goals are. Um, and then again, she's in grade nine and at the time. So you know, how much does she really know about making a decision for the rest of her life about what you want to do? It's not really about that. It's just um, in, in her situation, it was going to the best academic school that she could go to that would provide her with the most amount of range of things that could she could potentially want to go to in terms of what she might want to study and then what the impact of being at that school might have on going to graduate schools and things like that which is ultimately what it's after and then the the playing part of it yeah that's kind of my thing but the going to school part of it that's her and she's got a got to be comfortable going there and so trying to arrive at the best decision of what makes the most sense and even when to commit does it make sense to commit right now or should should she wait um what what really is the what really is the right thing i mean those it's all it was a lot of a lot of deciding and and, and figuring out what exactly she wanted to do. Now we were lucky. Ella is very committed to what she wants to do and her personality lends itself well to an early commitment where some kids it may not. So now you don't have to worry about that. Thankfully. Um, I think it's a lot better in the way that it's set up, uh, but it's, it, it, it was a process like a real process. And I'm, and I'm sure you saw some, some other kids and their parents kind of going a little nutty about this whole thing any any advice that you see from what you saw other parents do that you would say like hey don't do this um yeah i mean like again what the biggest challenge i think is the when you when we were engaged in it there's it was the last year known to be the last year in which all these early commitments were going to occur so it was literally like um you you felt almost like a like at a breakfast buffet you know like where it's like you're you're trying to market the kids are trying to market themselves the best way they can and some kids were getting attention a lot of attention while other kids were not getting that attention and then there was like people asking me for advice about like hey like what's your experience been like and i'm like well the honest truth is is like whatever insight I may have is probably not going to do you as much good. I mean, generally I can give you some ideas, but the specifics surrounding it, I mean, the way my kid is and the way your kid is, they're two totally different people and they're going to want two totally different things. So it's difficult to be able to lend yourself um, too much advice as to what, as to what to do. So um, I think that that's a really important aspect is that it's very individual. And the hardest thing for parents to do is the commit is committing uh, 
themselves to trying not to be too jealous of situations that are occurring around you. Yeah. Um, and, oh, why is this kid getting into my kids better than that kid or this? Uh, when you talk about schools, the fit in the way that kids, like some kids are going to fit at a certain place. Other kids are not. It doesn't necessarily mean one kid's better than the other. It's just, it's about getting the right fit. This isn't like the OHL or Western Hockey League where it's a draft. And that it, it's not like that. It's it, You're going to a school and it's a very different uh, process. So I think when parents get nutty, I think it's born from the idea of an expectation that their kid belongs in a conversation that they're not in. So you know that there's four kid, four schools coming to see Ella Belfry, but you believe that your kid is equal to, if not better, or maybe in the conversation of Ella. And now you're like, well, why is those four kids, four schools coming to see them and not necessarily my kid? And I think that's where it gets problematic. And, and I think the, the best advice I have, especially now with the way the rules are, try to figure out what your kid specifically wants, not which schools would necessarily want them. What does your school, what does your kid want? Particularly girl, I think it's more important. It's not like you're going to go to, uh, you're not a boy going to go play at a university for one year and sign an NHL contract and you're gone. That's not how you're going to be there for four years. So figure out academically, what are they, well, how good are they and, and what types of schools should they really be looking at? How, how good are they academically? Because honestly, at the academic opportunity is what opens the doors. Then the hockey becomes another, because you could be a great hockey player, but you might not qualify to get into certain schools. You can just lop all those schools off. You can't get in those. So now you're left with a certain, so academically, you want to be able to qualify for the most amount of schools to create options. Then from there, your skills are going to create options for you. But really, you should be pinpointing four or five schools that you really want to go to and begin a bit of a marketing campaign from your kid's behalf to try to get the attention of those schools that you want to go to and see if you can draw the attention you want rather than just waiting and hoping for someone to want them. Yeah. Be more proactive, even if your kid's one of the top kids. I think rather than just sitting back and waiting, you can be proactive and, and, and announce like your school is a school that I would love to go You're on to. our short list. Yeah. Yes. And, and so now the school may be inclined to go to a tournament or be at tournaments that you're at. And then now you can create, you know, you, there can be an understanding of interest. We as a, as a family are interested in going to your school. Now the question mark is, would, would our kid be in the conversation here at all? And then you can kind of deduct it from there. But I don't know that we do enough of that, particularly on the girls' side, where I think it's even more sensitive to go to the right school that's the right fit. Perfect. Perfect. Well, Daryl, I really appreciate the time. I got two quick questions that are selfish in nature, um, and I want to ask you those, and then, then I'm going to let you go. Um, so I know you have a bunch of pro playmaker videos that you created over the years that are only a snippet are on uh, YouTube. I was wondering if you're ever going to release the full videos now that you have the book out on, on the past, like your, your old archive. And I know they're a little bit outdated, but there. did you ever release them? Um, I've had this question many, many times, and the truth of them is, is that the, a lot of the links don't work anymore, and it just is like, I, it would take me time to go through and actually update the way in which there's stuff, so I haven't, the answer is always no, because I don't, I never <laughs> wanted to take the time to go back and go through them, but maybe one day I would, I would uh, just maybe give that project to somebody and let them do it. There is a lot of it that's outdated not outdated in the sense that like it's totally outdated, but there's a lot of uh, things that I, from my own perspective, have grown to find more effective ways. I, I, I'm better than, you know, my information that I provided was good for that time, but maybe not be as good for this time. Gotcha. Gotcha. And, and I heard last week that you mentioned that uh, you only included in the book about a third of what you could have put in the book. So then the next obvious question is, are you going to write another book, uh, you know, specific to offense, you know, to, to creating more offense and things like that? Is that, that potentially going to happen down the line? I, 
I really enjoyed the writing process. I didn't know how that was going to work and I didn't know necessarily, I knew writing, writing a book was something that I wanted to do, but I wasn't sure how the process was going to be. And then of course, once you put it out there, you're not sure how it's going to be received. If if anybody's actually going to, going to like it and value it. And the the early indication since we released the book in November uh, is that there's a lot of people who've really enjoyed it. So it's got me thinking now that there this is something that because I enjoyed it so much and because there seems to be even more of an appetite of these types of books and there's a lot more t- t- discussions that we can have um, that I can have as it relates to the different type of books that we can we can do. It is something that interests me. So uh, maybe- All right, so breaking it, news. We've got breaking news on this podcast. That, uh, yes, <laughs> there, I, I am thinking about it. Now it's a question of whether, I mean, uh, it also come down to the publisher, whether or not they feel like they were uh, properly compensated for the work that, that they put in. So if it lines up that they're happy with the sales of the book and they think that it's something that we could do going forward. I thoroughly enjoyed my publisher, the ones that we had. Uh, Triumph Books was phenomenal uh, in the in the in the writing process for me. So, you know, hopefully they're at a stage where they say, "Yeah, this is uh, this was good for us too." So, then I would be I would be really excited to do something else. Awesome, that's great, great. Well, Daryl, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. This has been highly informative. Um, um, you know, I'm really hope that uh, a lot of uh, parents and and female hockey players listen to this and hear things that they haven't heard before and um, you know this has been outstanding so thank you again for coming on the podcast my pleasure thanks again okay that was amazing i really appreciate daryl for coming on the podcast i learned a whole bunch of things that i hadn't heard him talk about before Um, and if you haven't read his book i really strongly getting a copy of it i've read it twice already and it's amazing just the small things that even as a hockey parent you can pick up that you can talk to your kids about and really get a lot out of it and and help their way of thinking and improve their hockey iq and remember If you got something out of today's podcast, we'd really appreciate it if you'd like, follow, subscribe, and leave us a review so we can help share this important hockey information with folks just like you.